just sing that song. Um, and I would be um, enamored with the way they would sing it. Because as they were singing that song, they were reminding themselves of what God had brought them through. Of how God had taken them through tests and trials. And that's what we're going to explore today. So when they sung Your Grace and Mercy, it's a simple song. But it's powerful. And now I'm of an age where I can see your grace and mercy. Hallelujah. We're going to be um, in the scripture of Genesis chapter 40, 48. Right, I'm going to try not to be before you too long. Um, not because of Father Time, but you know, because of, you know, a different time. Um, Genesis chapter 48, um, and um, if everyone has it, or everyone can see it on the screen, we'll read it together, um, and I will begin. One day, not long after this word, came Joseph. Your father is failing rapidly. So Joseph went to visit his father, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Joseph arrived, Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to see you. So Jacob gathered his strength and sat up in his bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at last in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations and I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now I am claiming you, sorry, now I am claiming as my own sons these two boys of yours, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived. They will be my sons, just as Reuben and Simeon are, but any children born to you in the future will be your own, and they will inherit the land within the territories of their brothers Ephraim and Manasseh. Long ago, as I was returning from Padam Aram, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. We were still on the way, some distance from Ephraim, that is, Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, I buried her there beside the road of Ephraim. Then Jacob looked over at the two boys, are these your sons, he asked? Yes, Joseph told him. These are the sons God has given me here in Egypt. And Jacob said, bring them closer to me so I can bless them. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him and Jacob kissed and embraced them. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I would see your face again. But now God has let me see your children too. Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim towards Jacob's left hand. And with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay his hands on the boys' heads. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before you, whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walk, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys, may they preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. But Joseph was upset when he saw that his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. So Joseph lifted it to move it to Ephraim's head, to Manasseh's head. No, my father, he said, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. I know, my son, I know, he replied. Manasseh will also become a great people but his younger brother will become even greater, and his descendants will become a multitude of nations. So Jacob blessed the boys that day with this blessing. 
The people of Israel will use your name when they give a blessing. They will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manasseh. In this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Jacob said to Joseph, look, I am about to die, but God will be with you and you will take, back, take you back to Canaan, the land of your ancestors. And beyond what I have given your brothers, I am giving you an extra portion of land that I took from the Amorites with my sword and bow. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to ask them the question. We're family, right? Yes. We're family, right? I want you to turn to your other neighbor behind you and ask them the question. We're, we're family, right? It's the question. And the street amongst you will, will, will may realize that this is similar to Elder Tunde's message, what love has got to do with it. What, love, what does love have to do with it? And so really the, the title for this message in full is, what has love got to do with it? Part two, subtitle, we're family, right? Yes. Will you be seated? Really, the, the Bible is about family. I mean, and you could you could argue it's, it's really only um, about family. You know, Yahweh being a family in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, decided that he wanted to create a family on earth. Adam and Eve became his children, and the two became the first family as they were joined together and became one and they had children and as we look at the, the, the bible as we survey the bible we especially the old testament we see that god would 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 regularly focus on family he would focus on the family of noah the family of david the family of, of abraham the family of gideon and ruth and so we see that that god has always had an interest in family. In fact, family is God's idea. And so, as we as we look through the Bible, we see that God had a particular interest in one particular family, the family of Abraham. And, and in fact, it wasn't Abraham's whole family. It was just him at the time. And so God said to Abraham, I want you to remove yourself from your other family and take you to a place that I'm going to show you and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to take you to a land that's going to be flowing with milk and honey and through you the whole world will be blessed and, and, and sometimes all it takes is just one family to listen sometimes you know I, I, I've listened to so many stories of just one family sometimes it's just the great grandmother or the great grand grandfather who was the first in their family to, to take on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through that one decision, they bless all of the lines further down. In fact, sometimes uh, they, 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 they would, they would their, their faith would encourage their brothers and their sisters and even their mother and their father to take on the name of Jesus. All it takes is one family. And it was through this one family that the that Abraham's family that Jesus Christ would come down and, and bless the whole world. Sometimes it's one family that will create a whole denomination, churches, organizations, businesses that will bless not just the body of Christ but the whole world. And so for for, for some of us, for many of us in here, sometimes we are just the one family. We're just the one family that just decided to take on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we're wondering to ourselves, is it worth it? Have I made the right decision? Have I made the right decision to separate myself slightly for the name of Jesus Christ? Because sometimes that can be a lonely journey. Because, because if you've grown up in a, in, in a family where there is a suspicion against the church, then when you tell them that you've become a Christian, their first thought is you come to take away my family. Sometimes they will tell you why you're spending so much time in church. What about us? We are your family. But sometimes all it takes is one family. And Abraham had enough faith 
to separate themselves. And although he may have taken a lot, but we'll forget that. Um, he had enough sense to separate himself and leave a place of wealth because Abraham was wealthy where he was. He didn't need to separate, he was okay. But it took one family and he, and he made a decision to follow after Yahweh. And so as we, as we, as we, you know, as we get, into this, get into this particular story, I want to focus on a few chapters before. So in chapter 47, we see that now we have Abraham, we have Isaac, and now you have Jacob. And Jacob has, has had his sons, and his sons have had sons and daughters. And they're in the land of Canaan. Right? They're in the promised land. Yes? The land that's flowing with milk and honey. But the land has famine. The promised land has famine. The land that's meant to be flow of milk and honey has famine. Have you ever been in a situation where God has told you to go somewhere, you heard him, you prayed and fasted, you sought spiritual oversight, and when you got there, there's famine. You've taken a new job, you've prayed and fasted possibly, I prayed and fasted. And I get to the new job, the people don't like me, I don't understand the industry, I'm getting, I'm getting hell from there, I'm back in your and I'm like, but I, but I prayed and I fasted about this. Where's the famine coming from? Or maybe you, you know, you've just got married, you're just in a new relationship, and you know, you've been, you prayed and you, you fasted and you, you caught it the right way. You got spiritual oversight. You know, everyone's praying with you. It's blessed you feel right within your spirit. You get married, famine. You're arguing, you don't, you're, you're thinking to yourself, I thought I knew you, I thought I knew you. Where's the signs? I need to know, what happened to the signs? I didn't know you were this person, I didn't know you were this person. Famine, famine in the promised land. But if you notice in Genesis chapter 42, Jacob had to say to his Jacob, the old man, had to say to his sons, why are you standing around here in this famine? There's grain in Egypt. Go to Egypt and get grain. And sometimes we can be so consumed with the famine around us that we forget to see the fruit around us. We can be so consumed with fear, the fears around us, we can't see the help that is near us. We can be so clouded by things that's going on. We can, that, that we, we see so much wrong, but we forget to see the right that is around us. And sometimes we need to, we, sometimes we need to listen to the people that's around us to say, hey, there's help if you need it. That although I have told you to go to this place that will produce milk and honey, it's not always going to be a straight line. And so accept the help. And so Jacob had to encourage his own sons to go and get help, to go and seek grain, even though they were in the promised land that was meant to be filled with milk and honey. Sometimes you have to go back to go forward. And so that's, it's, it's, it's interesting that that the children of Israel are in a state of in a place of famine. You know, we're in, we're in you know, Black History Month and, and it is similar to how when our parents and our grandparents came over here. Because over there in the Caribbean, there weren't there were as much opportunities in terms of job-wise. And, and for them, they were invited to come over here. Because they, 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 Britain needed help to, to rebuild itself after the war. But when they, when they, when they, when they got here, they realised that it wasn't their Commonwealth countries that they wanted to come over here. It was the other Commonwealth countries that they wanted to come over here. They didn't realize that at the time. And so when they came here, they experienced all kinds of prejudice and, and discrimination. They faced real hardship. And so, you know, many that came over were Christians. They were believers in Christ Jesus. And so when they came over, they thought, let me go into the house of the Lord. Because in the house of the Lord, I will find refuge for my soul. 
And when they came into the house of the Lord, they realized that the discrimination they were facing out there was also in there too. Sometimes people would leave pews. Sometimes they wouldn't shake your hands. Sometimes as they were leaving, the vicar would say, thank you for coming, but please don't come back again. And so, and you have to remember that, you know, not all um, Caribbeans that came over were Pentecostal. A lot of them were Anglican, a lot of them were Methodist, a lot of them were, were Roman Catholics. And it doesn't matter what denomination they came into, a lot of them faced and experienced the same things. But what was special about that particular generation is that being people of faith, they said, okay, I'm going to start my own church. I'm going to start my own fellowship. And so, as we, if, as we remember, they started their fellowships in their living rooms. One family at a time. One family at a time. One family made the decision. And one family became two families. And two families became ten families. And to the point where the living room couldn't hold all of the families together. And so they decided to have, they had to rent community halls. And sometimes when they were renting these community halls, sometimes they would have to get there two, three hours before because they had to clean up the party that was there before. They had to clean up all the, all the cigarette butts and all the beer cans and, and then clean up and then spend an hour to bring out the walls just so that they can have service. And, and, and then sometimes the wardens would, would put the time, it must be done by two o'clock. And if the service is still going, they switch out the power. And so they decided, I need to get my own church building. And so they would save up their money over and above their tithes to put towards the church building. Some, in fact, would take on second jobs for the particular purpose, just so they could buy their own church building. And so you find that a lot of these people there were the forerunners before for the denominations such as Assemblies of God or the Church of God in Christ or, or New Testament Assemblies or New Testament Church of God or, or Bethel or UPC or, or many other of these kind of Pentecostal denominations that in and amongst themselves they decided that they're not, they wasn't just going to stay here in the famine, that they were going to believe in God and buy their own buildings because they understood where they were coming from. Now, my West African brothers and sisters came a little bit after the, after the Caribbean and Midwest generation. They, when they came over, they experienced the same thing as the Caribbeans. They're like, boy, this is harsh. So they would visit the Caribbean churches as well, and, 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 and some, some would stay, and, 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 and some would, many would, would leave. Not for, some for, not some for only particular reasons, such as they wanted to be around the community that reminded them of home. They wanted to be in a service and, 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 and hear the same songs that they had heard back home, speak the same language they had heard back home. But some of them would leave because of the discrimination between each other. That some of them, that the Caribbeans and the West Africans held certain stereotypes against each other that would reverberate for decades. That they had attitudes towards each other that wasn't, it didn't amount to anything, but it caused a schism. And that's why a lot of the time you see that there are distinctly Caribbean and West African churches to this day. Not, not only for the reason of discrimination, as I said, some wanted just because they wanted to be around their own, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with embracing your own culture. God loves that. But sometimes, because of the stereotype that we held about each other, it stopped fellowship. And so it's easy for us to point the finger to people for the person who doesn't look like us, and we talk about discrimination. But if we're family, then we have to deal with discrimination with the people that look like us. But if I look like you and you look like me, then how can I discriminate against you if we're family? And, and some of those stereotypes and attitudes still exist today. I have friends and friends of friends whose parents did not go to the wedding because they were married in the Caribbean or West Africa. And they're Christians. I'm not, talking about, I'm, not, I'm not talking about those who are not Christians 
talking about people who are praying and fasting supposedly. They are Christians and they did not attend weddings because of the fact that they are married to a Caribbean or they married to a West Africa. And if and if and if and if if we're gonna and if we're gonna and sometimes you know we hold these stereotypes even now in here. And, and sometimes we can pretend that we don't, but let one of them marry your children. <laughs> then we then we'll see your real attitude, right? Let them have their kids come round. Sometimes our parents or our aunties might say something, we don't say anything. But if we're family, then we don't treat each other like that because we're family, right? And so God is saying that we can't honor that. If we want to be in unity, if we want to go out there, then we need to start in here. Then we need to start in here. We can't put a finger out there to the people that don't look like us, but we can't sort out the disunity of the people that look like us. And so Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to get grain. And eventually they would meet Joseph. And now they had to have a family conversation. Now, possibly, would you let your daughter marry to this family? Let's remind ourselves of, of, of Abraham's and Jacob's family. Let's remind ourselves. <laughs> so Jacob's sons wanted to kill their brother and then decided, let's not do that. Let's throw him in a ditch and sell him to save him. <laughs> and then their sister Dina was, was raped essentially by the men of Shechem. And so what they did is that they said to the men of Shechem, why don't you get circumcised? And then on the time when they're most vulnerable, they came in and killed all of them. And then the rest of the brothers came and plundered the town. Or what about Judah who tried to trick a prostitute out of a son according to their customs? Or what about Jacob, their father, who tricked his own twin brother out of the birthright? Or what about Abraham who had to send away his own son because he disobeyed God? Would you marry, would you let the child marry to that family? But if we're honest, if we're honest, every single one of our families has stuff like this going on. Every single one of our families, we have done stuff to each other or as a family to other people that we would rather not let them hit the light of day. And so we can point the finger at Abraham's family and say that they're crazy, but your family's crazy too. My family is crazy too. There's things that have gone in our family that not even you know that's gone on. Because it's unspeakable. We just have the benefit that we can read about it. And we can, we can learn from it. But every single one of the family that's, going, that's on this earth is just as crazy. But it was through this family that the saving of the world would come. It was through this family that God would show us the goodness of God. It was through this family that he would show us his grace and his mercy. It was through this family that he would show us his faithfulness. It was through this family he would teach us about worship and forgiveness. It was through this one family, as crazy as they are, that it would show us who God is. This one family, this crazy family that did all of these things, and I missed that things. <laughs> But it was through this one family. And so that's why God, that's why the Bible says that God doesn't look as a man looks. And so we can't write off a family. We can't write off anyone's family. And so sometimes we might be looking at someone's family and going, why? But sometimes you should be saying, boy, on your knees. Because we don't know where God 
is taking that family. We could never have predicted, if we were sitting in that place, just as Jacob was about to bless Joseph, we couldn't predict where God was gonna, was gonna take Jacob's family. We could never have known what the things he would have produced and the kind of children that he would have produced. And so sometimes when we look at people's family, let's not judge. Let's pray. Because that family that we're judging could be the key to your blessing. It could be the key to your blessing. The same thing that you're struggling with, it could be a key to your blessing. This family was the key to our blessing. God has reminded Abraham, he said, that I will make you my children more stars than you have. It was through Abraham's family that the Savior came. Let's be careful on how we talk about God's family because we are family, right? And so Joseph and his brothers came face to face. Face to face. They saw their sin right before them. They saw their sin right before them. In them looking in the eye. And all kinds of things was going through their minds. Oh, what am I going to tell dad? I told him that he was dead. Ripped by an animal. And, and, and all kinds of things. But, but when Joseph saw them, Joseph wept. Joseph wept. Joseph was within his rights. Joseph was in his, was within his rights to get revenge. He could have easily sent away the ten brothers, kept Benjamin, kept Jacob and said, on the one. He could have easily kept them away. He was within his rights. I'm not saying it's biblical, I'm not saying it's right, but he's within his rights. You tried to kill me. He was within his rights to do that. And, 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 but Joseph wept. And even when the brothers tried to apologize, we know, we know the saying, Joseph said that God, God sent me before, ahead of you. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and, and we say that, but look at this. When Joseph should have sought revenge, he wept. And sometimes, all it takes is one person to forgive, to break the tension. With one act of forgiveness, he reconciled a whole family in turmoil. Over 70 people, he, with one act. One act, he just wept and he forgave. He reconciled a whole family in turmoil. But not only that, he saved millions. With one act of forgiveness, he saved millions of people. He was within his rights to seek revenge. But he recognized that this was bigger than him. He would have grown up listening to his father and his grandfather saying that Yahweh has taken us out of the land of Chaldeans and into Canaan. And God is going to bless us that from a land flow of milk and honey, that God is going to do this and God is going to do that. He would have heard it from Abraham. He would have heard it from, from Jacob. He grew up and he would have reminded himself constantly of what's going on. And so when he saw his brothers come, go before him, realizing that there's a famine in Canaan, that was going through the back of his mind. And he realized that with that one act of forgiveness, he saved the whole nation. And so that's why when I told the story of our grandparents and our parents coming over here, we have to remember what we're doing here. We have to be reminded, we have to tell our children and our grandchildren of why we are here. How we came over here, how God has brought us through, how your grace and mercy brought me through. Because, because that brings context to the forgiveness. When, when Joseph forgave, when Joseph forgave, that was in the back of his mind. That's why you can say, God sent me ahead of time to save a nation. Notice he said, God sent me ahead of time. His perspective changed. One, all it takes is one act 
about things that don't matter. We have been gossiping and backbiting about each other. And God is saying, family doesn't do that. We've been holding malice against each other and we need to release it because we're family. And I know being in a family is hard, it's difficult. Sometimes we don't like each other. We'll argue, but we have to love each other. And it's going to take the grace of God for me to love you and you to love me. But we have to do it. Because as Joseph was reminded of himself, of the promise that Yahweh had given to his grandfather and his great-grandfather, we need to be reminded that when we are dealing with each other, when we are forgiving one another, that there is a context and a history behind us. That no matter what church we've ended up in here, our forefathers, whether from the Caribbean or from Africa or wherever we're from, they came here and they built something and they made disciples. It wasn't about the just building the denominations. They went out and they made disciples. So what we are doing in here is important. But we can't go out there if we are in schism with each other in here. forgiveness in context. This is why the children of Israel, this is why, this, you ever wondered why God was very, you ever wondered why when God, when the children of Israel went over the river Jordan and he said to them very specifically, he said, I want you to take 12 stones and I want you to place them at the bank of the river Jordan. Do you ever wonder why God is very specific about that? Because he wanted them to remember what God had brought them through. He wanted to remember that God had put them with a mighty hand, but also that when they look, and the Bible says that you will tell your kids, and your kids will tell their kids, and their kids will tell their kids. That's why the Passover and the Tabernacles of Booth is in perpetuity. It's a reminder of where God has brought them from. It's a reminder that, then, that then when family get into schism and schism, when, when people argue, they have to remember themselves that look at where God has brought us from. We cannot be like this. We were in captivity. We were in slavery. We can't be like this. So that's why, that's why every time when they, and if you notice that whether a Jew is a religious Jew or a non-religious Jew, they all celebrate the Passover. Every single one of them, even if they don't believe, they recognize the cultural significance of their history. And so what we do in here is important. We have to recognize and remember where God had brought us from. So when Joseph forgave, he opened up the door to many things. So when we get to chapter 48, Jacob was about to die. But he called Joseph and his sons first. Chapter 49, he calls all of his sons together. But in chapter 48, he calls just Joseph and his sons. And he said, I never thought I would see you in my own eyes. Because I was told that you had been ripped to asunder by a wild animal. I never thought I would see you again in my own eyes. But now I see you and your sons. And if you notice, Jacob blessed Joseph more than once. Because he blessed him in the next chapter as well. But he blessed him in this, in this chapter. And, and I don't have time to go through the, the, the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh, but one thing that I want, us, that I want to, to, to note is, is that although Reuben was the eldest, Joseph received a double portion. Reuben technically should have got the double portion. So when you look at the 12 tribes of Israel, you don't see Joseph there. You see Ephraim and Manasseh. Reuben should have got the double portion, but Joseph got the double portion. And the reason why Joseph got the double portion is because he forgave. He saved the whole nation. And could he say, if we want the double portion, we have to forgive one another? There can be no double portion without forgiveness. Paul talks about the root of bitterness and unforgiveness. And have you, have you ever noticed that when you come across a, a bitter and unforgiving person, how poisonous they are? 
it spreads. That's why he would even he reminds the Galatians in chapter five. He says that you have to be careful that you're biting each other, you're devouring each other. Be careful lest you destroy each other. And so God is saying we have to let go of unforgiveness and bitterness and, and, and backbiting. You know, when I was when I was uh, younger, I'm almost done. When I was younger, um, around about eight years age actually, um, I was quite boisterous. I was quiet. I was, you know, I was, I was, I was a bit a handful for for for, for the teachers. Like I talked a lot, which is no surprise. Uh, and, um, and and you know, they wanted the, the teachers were saying that you know I may have ADHD and all these kind of type of things. And this is back in the in the must be very early nineties. And so my mom didn't necessarily want to accept that, so she said to herself, okay, I need to get this boy, I need to get him to release his energy somehow. And so she took me, she decided to take me to, to try out Saturday schools. And so she took me to a number of Saturday schools and one didn't work out, but she found this Nigerian Saturday school. And this, this school was, was Nigerian, they taught Nigerian, spoke Nigerian, Sun Nigeria, so Nigeria Saturday School started by a, a, a mother and a father in their living room and, 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 it, and it ballooned down into the community where they had to rent out community hall. And, and, and they said, no, we'll take it, no problem, because and they were Christians. We were, my family were Christians at the time, so they were Christians. And, but they had a belief, and they still do, that every child was born to shine. Amen. Every child was born to shine. That was their motto. And so they didn't care whether you were Jamaican or Ghanaian or Nigerian, they didn't care. They believed that God had given them the mandate to teach the kids, especially the black kids, that, that every child was born to shine. And so, and that was the place where I first heard the gospel. Because my, my, my family are not Christians. So I first heard the gospel in that school. And, and, and he would call most of us his son. Or his daughter, he called me and my sister, his son and his daughter, even to this day, my son, my son. Because he believed that we were all family. He didn't care where you were from. We were all family in the family of God. And so that was the place where I first heard the gospel. And so fast forward 25 years later, he gives me a call to say that as he had imported the gospel into me, I want you to input the gospel to my church 25 years later. Elder Tunde was with me, went with me that day. And that was all because he believed that we were family. And I and I and God is saying that Joseph took that one act to forgive. And so let's all weep together so we can be reconciled and we can go out there and get the better. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.